the key questions in the Word of God, the key questions in Scripture, is a concept that I thought would be worthy for us to get into, to study the Word of God in such a way as to look at these important questions and see the answers and make application to our lives. And so I've got a little bit of outline work I want to share with you about how we've structured this. And you know that first we dealt with the, uh, the questions that came early in the Scripture. We just call these the first questions. Uh, that is, Adam, where art thou? And from there. And so uh, we have those that had to do with the fall of man and the, the God's restoration plan early on. We talked about Cain and Abel. And where is your brother, Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? Those were the first questions that we find in the Word of God. And they're very profound and telling. And we dealt with those. And uh, then we got into some practical questions, just things that God uh, put in the Word of God to help us think, uh, to start our processes. And one of them that we talked about is, uh, where, why are you here? Uh, where did you come from, rather? Where did you come from, and why are you here? And this is not only found in the instance with Hagar, but also uh, other places in the Word of God where <clears throat> God asks a practical question. <clears throat> have you thought about, excuse me, <clears throat> have you thought about where you are and where you're going? And we always need to ask ourselves questions like that of a practical nature. But they also have, of course, spiritual application. But now we're going to begin another category, and that is what I call intellectual questions. Intellectual questions. Now, these are questions that are designed by God to come into our intellect, to come into our minds, and through the gate of the mind, to go into the heart and the soul. Uh, so these are things that you think about. God asks questions that we are supposed to give credence to and think about. And then we're going to have doctrinal questions. Uh, these are going to be a good part of the study of key questions in Scripture. And then also we're going to spend some time looking at devotional questions. That is, those questions which bring us to worship and adore God. So now let's talk about these intellectual questions and we're just going to summarize what is going, as we're going to get into it, we're going to see that it's very involved, but we're just going to kind of summarize with this question, where were you when I made the universe? Now we're going to get into Job, Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 4. Now let's set the background. You remember that God brings up Job in a meeting that he had with Lucifer, with Satan, and he said, have you considered my servant Job, that he's an upright and a man in the world, and he's perfect and, and he's righteous? And so God brought it up, and, and then Satan said, uh, well, yeah, he serves you, but uh, you let me take away all his possessions, uh, and he'll curse you to your face. And so God allowed Satan to do that, to take away his wealth. And uh, so then he, uh, he still, Job still continued to worship God and to trust him, and he didn't curse God. And so Satan says, well, okay, yeah, a man will give everything for his own life, but you let me touch his body, you let me afflict him, then he'll curse you to your face. And, and God said, well, you go ahead, but don't take his life. And so he was smitten with boils. And so he's now destitute, he's poor, his children are gone. He is sitting on the ground, scraping his boils with a potsherd and in terrible shape. And so his three friends come to visit him, to comfort him. And you ever heard of the phrase Job's comforters? Well, it's kind of a satire because they started out being friends, but they ended up just giving him a hard time. And so for chapter after chapter after chapter, we have this long, wonderful Hebrew poetic uh, discourse between Job and his three friends. And his three friends are trying to tell him how bad he is, and he must be evil, he must be wicked for God to have allowed all this to happen to him. And he then talks back to them and says, well, I don't know what I've done this bad. I'm not perfect. I know that. But I, I've done this. I've done that. I've been righteous. I've clothed the naked. I've fed the hungry. I've protected the afflicted. I've, I've never done anybody in harm. I've, I'm honest in my business. Uh, uh, I don't understand this. And he said in one place, <clears throat> he said, I feel like a target. And God has taken his bow and arrow and is shooting arrows into me. I don't understand why. And he complained and complained and complained and complained and complained and complained. And he cursed the day he was born, and he just bemoaned his life, and he used great and many words. Well, here's what's interesting. God was listening and watching all of this, as he always does, and he just let them go for a time. Just let them talk. Talk, 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 talk. Job was eloquent. 
And for the most part, he was right. He didn't understand this. He was just expressing himself. He, he was telling how he felt. And nobody can argue with how he felt because if we were in that situation, we'd feel the same way and we'd say similar things. But then something happened. Job chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Now, <clears throat> when I read the Word of God, I like to see the words that are used. You know what the word whirlwind is? It's a wind that whirls. Not hard to figure that out. It's the same in the Hebrew. <clears throat> this would be a form of a tornado. Whether it is a smaller ones that you see often that just gather trash and, and uh, work uh, amongst the dirt and the dust, uh, call them dust devils or whatever you will, it was some kind of twister, some kind of whirlwind, but it was a divine whirlwind. It was something like the Shekinah glory of God. It was a manifestation of God's Spirit, and a voice comes out of this whirlwind. And what a voice, what, what things this voice says. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Now that's a, that's a real question, isn't it? Who is this that talks so much about what he doesn't know anything about? Who is this that's so eloquent to share his ignorance? Who is this that's saying a lot of things that you don't even know if they're right or not? Okay, now notice. Gird up now thy loins like a man. Now, what this is, is God calling Job on the carpet. Stand up. Wrap your belt around your robe and stand up like a man. He was in a place of leisure. He was sitting on the ground. His robes were loose. He said, I want you to stand up. We're going to have a talk. And you're going to stand up before me. Now, what he is now is he is in judgment. By the way, we will all one day stand before the, the righteous throne of God to give an account. So he says, gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. So Job had been asking all these questions and making all these statements. Now God is appearing to Job. Now, what are his friends doing at this time? Well, his friends have either run away. God didn't tell his friends to stand, but in my mind, here's what I think his friends are doing. I think they've got their faces on the ground and their hands on top of their head. Uh, I don't think they're in the same place Job is here. But now, as Job has been called on the carpet by God, I believe he stands up, and I cannot help but believe uh, that he is trembling before this mighty voice that's coming to him out of the whirlwind. And he says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Dear Father, help us to grasp this. Help us to catch it. Help us to see what's here. Help us to have a better understanding of what happened when God began to question Job and to ask Job questions that there were really no answers to that Job could bring, Lord, but were designed to bring him to a place where God wanted Job to be. And Lord, a place where all of us should be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Indeed, the first thing we should learn about God is that He is God and we're not. And that is what this is about. He is higher than us. In fact, He is much higher. He is so high that there's no comparison whatsoever. Job and his learned friends had engaged in a long discourse displaying their great intellect, their great wisdom, and uh, each of them, when they spoke, believed he was right. And they would argue with each other. They sounded like a bunch of first seminary students that were talking about questionable theological points. And one would correct the other, and the other one would correct the other. And Job was just sitting there getting ganged up on by all three of them. And they accused him of everything under the sun. And he didn't have any idea why they were uh, saying this. But here was their big conclusion. Their, their idea was, the only reason you're suffering like this is because you've committed some big sin and God's punishing you for it. That's, that's the only thing they could figure. But let's think about what God began to say to Job. Now, because this sermon could be two hours if I let it, I'm going to summarize the, the next few chapters. 
I'm just going to put them in a paraphrase form, but I want us to get the, uh, the idea of it. And you can go back and read it later. It's beautiful poetic prose. It's, it's wonderful for that. But the point I'm trying to make now is to get us an idea of the questions he, they asked them as if they would be asked today. Okay? He first of all says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now that's a rhetorical question because Job wasn't there. In other words, who's God? Me? You? Who is it that made the clouds and the sea? Ha has it been you to make the sun rise every morning? Now he's asking Job. Now Job's on the carpet. He's girded up his loins. He's standing up before God, trembling. And God says, are you the one that's running things? Do you make the sun rise in the morning, make it set? Have you been to the bottom of the sea? Have you seen beyond this life into the next? Have you measured the breadth of the earth? In other words, do you even know how big this earth is, much less anything else? Do you even know how big the earth is? Where does light come from? Where were you when it was made? Now, think about this. Moses doesn't know the answer to any of those questions. God does. So what is God doing? He's making a point. All right? Uh, he says, do you know the role that snow and hail we play, will play in the end times? Do you know that's actually in the book of Job, that God lets us know that God has reserved for the end times a role that the snow and the hail will play? God's going to use the weather patterns for His ultimate plan. Do you understand the weather patterns, and can you order them? Uh, do you, did you make the stars, and can you rearrange them? Uh, he asked Job all through the book of Job about the constellations, and he said, did you put all that up there? Are you the one that made the stars? Can you change them around if you want? Did you make the stars, and can you arrange them? Can you order the sky to bring rain? Can you make it lightning? Now, can you imagine being called on the carpet by God and being asked these questions? Because the implication is, Job may have been a little bit too big for his britches. And he may have thought a little more of himself than he should. Now, the question of why did God let, go, let Job go through all of those things, we know from the, all, all, you know, the entire book, it wasn't because he was wicked. In fact, it was God who talked about Job being more righteous than all the other people on the earth. So what was it about? Well, this was a test. This was a test of his faith. You see, God designed this whole thing not to bring Job down, although it initially did that. This whole thing was designed to bring Job higher. But before Job could be brought higher, he had to be pointed at where he actually is. And Job didn't know where he actually was. Not yet. Not really. These questions are to humble him. So can you make it rain? Can you make it lightning? Uh, who made man's brain capable of intellect? Did you make men wise? Did you make them have the intellect and, and the, the minds that they had? Uh, are you the one that gave man his brains? Is it you who set up the food chain and makes nature work? Uh, in this book of Job, God talks about the lions, and he talks about the different animals and how this all works. So are you the one that makes it where the lions get food, or do you arrange all of that? Can you tame the rhinoceros and get him to serve you like an ox? Now, I thought about that one. Has any of you ever seen a, a man with a plow hooked to a rhinoceros? I don't know that it's ever been in, in human history. Uh, God is asking this question. Look at that rhinoceros. And he's talking about that. And, it, and it's called a unicorn in the Bible. But from all the research that we make, there's only one animal that fits the description. And, and a rhinoceros is so wild that nobody's ever tamed it. <laughs> You're not going to put it in a, a place here in a, 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 like a stall. He'd just bust through and then come after you and your family. They, no, you can't, you can't tame the the, the rhinoceros. He says, did you make the different kinds of birds? And he mentions the peacock. He mentions the ostrich. Did you make these birds? Are you the one that made them? He said, did you invent the horse? Now, the horse is a wonderful animal. It can be used for many things, uh, for war, for peace, for, uh, for doing work, or for just transportation. He said, are you, are you the one? Did you make the horse, Job? Is it you who made the eagles and the hawks to fly? Was that you, Job? And finally, he sum to summarize <clears throat> what God was saying, are you in a place to correct Almighty God? Are you such a one that can call me evil and you good? That's, that's what God's dealing with Job about. Now, if Job was trembling when he stood up initially, he's trembling more now. Can you imagine? 
the whirlwind is speaking, and the voice that comes out of this whirlwind is the voice of God. And you know who I believe that voice is? The Word of God, the Logos, which is the second person of the Trinity. This is our Savior. This is Jesus. Listen, this is Jesus loving Job. And you say, wait a minute, it doesn't sound very loving, but it is. You see, because this is tough love. This is God loving Job by bringing Job an intellectual understanding of who he really is and who he really is not. Because we cannot know where we are unless we know where we aren't. We cannot know who we are unless we know who we aren't. And Job had a lesson to learn, and God was going to bring it to him. And this is the way he chose to do it. Can you imagine yourself in in his place to be rebuked and corrected? Listen, to be rebuked and corrected by a, a human authority figure is humbling enough. I don't know if any of you had to be corrected. I have many times in my early life. Sometimes it was my mother or my grandmother. Sometimes it was a teacher. Uh, Sometimes it was a a pastor. Uh, One time it was a judge uh, who gave me a good talking to. And I stood there and took it because I knew that I needed to hear it. And I was rebuked and I was corrected. Uh, Listen, can you imagine being rebuked personally by Almighty God Himself? This is what was happening to Job. To be called on the carpet by God was a very humbling experience. So after all these words, chapter after chapter after chapter of great, wonderful, poetic prose, we find in Job chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. Let's let's see what he answers. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. Okay, Job, that's a good starting point. We can begin to grow now. We can begin to learn. We can begin to be brought to a higher place. Behold, I am vile. He said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? Now that's a a fair question. How can I answer this? What can I say to this? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Now what Job is saying here is this. Lord, I've said a lot of things. But I think I'm just going to shut up. I'm done defending myself. I'm done questioning you. I'm done trying to make sense of all this. I'm done. I'm not going to say anything like that I said before. Listen, sometimes the best thing we can do is to be in the presence of God, realizing our sinfulness, realizing our frailties, realizing our faults and our shortcomings, and just be quiet before God. Just be quiet before God. That's where Job was. I will proceed no further. But God isn't through. He's got just a few more questions he's going to ask. We come to Job chapter 40, verses 6 and 7. It says, Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind, and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. And then he goes on to say this. Job 40, verse 8. Notice. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? In other words, are you in a place where you are going to be able to just change my plan? Or come up with a better plan than what I have? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God? Or canst thou thunder with a voice like Him? God is asking him some questions that deserve answers. Can you be like me? Can you be like God? He says, Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency, and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath, and behold every one that is proud and abasing. What he's saying is that, God, do you want this job? I mean, he's saying, Job, do you want God's job? Do you want to be God? Do you want to make these decisions? Do you want to be the one who comes out in your power and glory and do the things that only God can do? Is that your role? Do you, do you want to be me? That's what he's asking. 
Now listen, here's the thing. Job had come to a place where he recognized he's vile. God now says, yeah, but you don't know how vile yet. You don't know how proud you've been. You, you don't know to what degree you have been in my face, basically. And he says, uh, look on everyone that is proud and bring him low. You do it. You do it, Job. You look around, find the proud, you, you bring him low and abase him. And, and tread down the wicked in their place. Have you ever thought you're uh, saying, uh, caught yourself saying this? If I rule the world, this and this would be so. I have to admit I've said that sometimes. If I rule the world, this would be so. Well, listen, I don't want that job. I certainly don't want the job that God has in heaven. Now, there are things I'd like to see, and there are things that I wish God would do. But God has a plan that's different than my plan, and that's what prayer is for. We come before the throne of grace to ask we don't question God. We don't condemn God. We don't uh, accuse God of wrongdoing. We ask. And then we say, like Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. Now notice, he says this. He said, verse 13, Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then will I also confess unto thee that thine own right hand can save thee. Now, what Jesus, which I believe this was the second person of the Trinity, I believe this is our Lord talking to him, the Word of God, the Logos. God is saying to Job, when you can do what only God can do, then I'll confess that you can save yourself. Of course, the impact of this is Job you're not good enough. You never will be good enough. And you need someone to save you because you can't save yourself. That's the point of this. Now, whether or not Job in his worship and in his sacrifices had it in his mind that I'm doing good works before God that, that he should take note of and, and therefore reward me for these good works, maybe that's the kind of thoughts that Job was having. And many do think that in their religion. It's the same way today. They believe if they do this and do that and do the other and, and, and be holy and be good, that God will smile on them and let them go to heaven. Listen, God raised the standard to such a point that no man, no matter how righteous, even righteous Job, had to say, I am vile. And then God went on to say, not only are you vile, but listen, are you God? Can you be God? Can you do the things only God can do? No, you can't, can you? If you can be like me, if you can do only what, only what God can do, then I'll confess that you can save yourself. And that's what all this was about. We could summarize these, just to summarize them. Do you have veto power? over my decrees. Job, do I have to check with you before I do something? Do I have to run it by you before it's allowed to be done? Job, will you call yourself good and me evil? Is, is that what you would do? Job, can you do a better job of correcting the proud? Would you like that position? Job, are you able to judge the wicked? Job, have you considered God's greatness by examining the creatures like the elephant and the crocodile? God goes on in this word and he talks about behemoth. He talks about Leviathan. And all kinds of studies have been made about these creatures. It's ancient language. By the way, let's remind ourselves of something. Job, the setting of Job, the setting, is the oldest scripture in the world. It is older than Moses. It's older than the things we learn in the book of Genesis. And in fact, many people believe that Job is a story that is an oral tradition that came from before the flood. They believe it's that old. And it's interesting that the, that the word here in the word of God, it describes behemoth, this great big giant animal that when it drinks from the water, you wonder if it's going to drink the river dry. And here's an interesting thing. It moves its tail like a cedar. Now, many people have thought, well, this is an elephant. 
But you ever see an elephant's tail, a little wiggly thing in the back? It certainly doesn't move like a cedar. Listen, some people believe that this is a, a, a dinosaur, like uh, the Brontosaurus, by whatever name you give it today, the, the big giant thunder lizard. And you can imagine something that big when it went to drink out of a stream could just about drink it dry. And it talks about how large it is and how big it is and how, uh, uh, just the massiveness of it. And then it talks about Leviathan. It's a sea creature and it has teeth and scales. And when it moves, it just churns up the water and believe this to be like a, a large crocodile. And he says, can, can you go fishing for that? Can you tame that and make it walk on a leash? I mean, that, that's what God is saying to him. He wants Job to think. Listen, God says that when Job is able to answer all of these questions, then God will confess that Job can save himself. Now, the whole idea is this is, Job, you cannot save yourself. Job need to listen to this. Now, what was the result of these intellectual questions? Because, by the way, what we're looking at here is what we would call today science. A lot of these questions are scientific questions, uh, zoology, meteorology, uh, physics. Uh, these are studies. These are things that you could look around in the earth and, and, and talk about. And, and Job, even with the physical reality, was, was clueless. I, I don't know. But when it comes to the philosophical things, these are also things that we have in our intellect and our mind. Now, hold this thought. We are made in the image of Almighty God. God made Adam, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. That's the only creature in God's creation that that is said about. Now, who is God? Well, we know partly who God is because we were made in his image, and so we know this. If I have an intellect, then God is the ultimate intellect. Because something cannot come from something that's less. Only something can come with something that is greater. So if God made me able to think, that means he is the ultimate thought. He is the ultimate thinker. God gave me emotions. We have emotions. So God is the ultimate heart. He is the ultimate pathos. He is the ultimate passion. He is the ultimate zeal. He is the ultimate soul. And he also gave us a what? A body. So God has a form, a, a substance. Although he is a spirit, he's also Jesus Christ. Now what's the other part of our being? We have intellect, we have emotion, and what else do we have? Will. Volition. Will. God is the ultimate will. So, when we talk about intellect... Who knows everything? God. When we talk about emotions, who has the perfect set of emotions that are always right? God, and only God. Sometimes your emotions and my emotions are off kilter, out of whack. We can't trust them. Only God's emotions are tied to reality, tied to truth, tied to eternity. And when it comes to will, listen, have you ever used your free will to make dumb decisions? If you're like me, you certainly have, and you'd have to admit it. God never makes a decision other than the absolute perfect right decision. Jesus said, I came to do the will of my Father. Jesus never made a wrong move. He never made a wrong decision. So the result of God's intellectual challenge to Job was he, that Job realized that he was not God. Now we come to chapter 42, verse 1. Let's look at this. Then Job answered the Lord and said... I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Now Job, is, is, he's answering, he's saying, listen, I, I know you're God and I'm not and I know that you know everything including all the things I just said. He, his understanding of God has grown. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered, listen, I have uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Now, the way we would say this today, <laughs> Lord, forgive me, I didn't know what I was saying. I didn't know what I was talking about. 
I was saying an awful lot of words that make no sense. I was saying things that don't mean anything. Forgive me, Father. I was speaking without knowledge. I was speaking out of my ignorance. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. In other words, I've heard what people say about God. But now mine eye seeth thee. Now when he saw that whirlwind, he knew that that was a manifestation of God's presence. I'm sure he knew that wasn't God's full final presence of glory or he wouldn't be alive. But he said, I'm, I'm looking at a manifestation of God. I, I see you're here. I've heard about you, but now I am experiencing you. That's what Job is saying. Wherefore, wherefore, because I realize I've been saying things that I don't know what I'm talking about, because I recognize that this is you talking to me, wherefore I abhor myself. He says, I'm vile. He says, I didn't know what I was talking about. And now that I'm in God's presence, I abhor myself. Listen. If you talk to any psychiatrist anywhere, they'll tell you that's a bad thing. They, they'll tell you that you need to love yourself, you need to have self-esteem, and on and on it goes. I'm here to tell you today that you have not begun to be happy and content and well-adjusted until you first meet with God to realize how bad you really are and how much you need a Savior, Jesus Christ. Until then, you are deluding yourself. You are tricking yourself. You are walking in ignorance. You don't know God until you know you're not Him. And Job had come to that point. He, say, he said, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Because it, they were close by. And he just laid his head down before God. This was God loving Job. So that he would be brought to a place where God could then lift him. The proud God will abase, but the humble God exalts. And so if God would exalt someone, he must first humble them. If God will build someone, he must first break them. If God would call someone to rise, he must first dig their foundation deep in the earth. And sometimes that requires humility and suffering and hardship and trial. If God would make you better, he first has to bring you to a point where you realize how much you need to be better. Then we come again to the outline part of the message that Job's intellect was engaged, but the result was profoundly emotional and spiritual. The lessons that came from Job's great trial provided him with a greater understanding and appreciation of God than he could ever have had without this trial of faith. So let's summarize. What were these things that came to Job? First of all, there was an awareness of sin. Now he knew he wasn't perfect. He hadn't committed any great big sins that his friends had accused him of, but he, he was still a sinner. He was still a sinner before God. He had pride going for him. God helped him with that one. So he had an awareness of sin. And listen, if we are going to be saved, one of the important things, and in fact, the most important part of the beginning of that process is, is to know you need saving, to know that you are a sinner and you need to be saved. Uh, listen, uh, Jesus only has business with sinners. And if you're not a sinner, Jesus doesn't have any reason, for, uh, doesn't have anything for you. But if you're a sinner, uh, you're just the person Jesus came for. You're just the one that he came down. So you have to admit you're a sinner. He had an awareness of sin. What else came from this exchange? Well, he had an awe of God. Awe. Now that's something that I think, if it's not, if we're not careful, we'll lose that. The awe. Listen, we, we, we take it so much for granted. We, we, we sit and we listen and we hear and we look at our watches and we think, well, it'll be over soon. He'll be saying amen and I can go home. I know because I've sat in pews before. I know how it is. Have you ever just been in the awe of God? He's awesome. Listen, Job was brought to that point. 
And then what, was, what else was here? Humility. Humility. Job saw himself as he really was, so he could be raised to the place that God would have him be. Listen, pride will never lift you up. Pride will always bring you down. It is humility that raises you. And then there was also repentance. Repentance. He said, I repent in dust and ashes. Now we're going somewhere, Job. This is what this has all been about. Now you're in a place where God can bless you. When we come close to God, we become more aware of our sinfulness and need for forgiveness and restoration, and then God can begin to work. Now you can go through and read the rest of the story. In fact, I encourage you when you get home to do it, but I'll summarize this way. God dealt with his three friends. He rebuked them pretty strongly. He said, I'm against you because you spoke that which isn't right. And he said, but I'll forgive you if my man Job here intercedes for you. If Job prays for you, and if Job is your priest, I'll listen to him, but I'm not listening to you, but I'll listen to Job as he prays for you. In other words, he said, I'm going to make Job your pastor, you guys. Isn't that great? And then what else did God do? God blessed Job, and he lived 100, I think it was 130 years after this. A very long lifetime after this. And he had seven sons and three daughters. And his daughters were so pretty that nobody had any daughters prettier than Job's daughters. And he gave them inheritance among the brethren. And listen, Job had twice as much as he had before. But he was richer in this way. He was richer in his faith than he ever was before. He was richer in his peace. He was richer in his social standing. He was richer in every way a man can be rich. Some would say, well, why didn't he have twice as many children? Let's understand that, you see, people live forever, and so his previous children, they're still somewhere. They're with God. So he had twice as many children. Some are gone, and some are still here. Listen, the whole point of this intellectual exchange was to correct the thinking that Job had, that you and I sometimes have too, that we've got it all figured out. We don't. That we are good, we're not. That we can do things on our own to improve our situation, we can't. We are not truly right with God until we are like Job in a place will we realize how God, how high He is, and how low we are, and how blessed we are that His mercy has come to us through Jesus Christ. Dear Father, I pray that in our lives and hearts that we would, without having to go through the terrible things Job went through, because none of us would wish that upon ourselves, but that, Lord, we would make the intellectual journey for having read this book and having read the Word of God and having learned from other people's experiences, Lord, your greatness, your grandeur, your power, your intellect, your heart, and Lord, your ultimate will. Lord, that you are God and we are not. And we are so flawed. We are so much sinful that we need the washing that comes from Calvary's blood to wash away our sins And give us salvation that we did not deserve and could never earn apart from your grace that's given to us freely. Lord, I pray that if any are listening at this time, Lord, any under the sound of my voice, Lord, would make life's most important decision and come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, realizing, of course, that it is only Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that can save the soul. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.